Well, good morning. I d I'm going to try to speak up, but uh, please just shout out if you can't hear me. Um, if I start to trail off or get quiet, just make sure to let me know, and I'll try to keep speaking up. Um, so I, I'm a movement disorder specialist, and just to sort of clarify what that means, um, in, the, in the world of neurology, we use the term movement disorders to describe a subspecialty within neurology, um, which is uh, diseases, neurologic diseases, where people have a li little bit too much movement or a little too, too little movement. That's sort of a sort of general way of describing it, but what it boils down to is um, a lot of it is tremor and Parkinson's disease. I mean, that's sort of the, the, uh, the main uh, patient population. So what I am is someone who's had s an additional training specifically in Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. And then in addition, my practice is predominantly that. So my clinic is sort of majority movement disorders, and I see a little bit of general neurology as well. Um, so this talk is really going to be sort of a sort of broad stroke about Parkinson's disease, you know, from sort of just to give you a ba an overview. So um, for some people, there will be a lot of things that you may have heard before, um, but just to give everybody a framework to, to think about how um, we think about Parkinson's disease and to help you understand it better. So what is, what is Parkinson's disease? Um, it's a, it's a considered a progressive neurologic condition um, that affects the motor system. And we, we focus a lot on motor, but um, we're finding more and more that there are issues with what we call non-motor symptoms, um, which are becoming more recognized in terms of their significance, in terms of quality of life, and, and just basically trying to improve people's quality of life. Um, the primary motor symptoms that we see with Parkinson's are stiffness, a slowness, a tremor, not always, um, and difficulty with balance. Um, these symptoms, these motor symptoms, are caused by a lack of a chemical in the brain called dopamine. So what is dopamine? Um, that's an important thing to understand about Parkinson's. Dopamine is a neurochemical, um, and basically it's involved in the communication from one brain cell to another brain cell. So one brain cell communicates with another brain cell by sending out signals. Dopamine is, is an example of one of those signal chemicals that, um, that it communicates a message. And dopamine is produced in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra. And what that basically means is dark substance. And you'll, I'll show you what that means. Um, and dopamine is involved in um, motor circuits in the brain, as well as emotional circuits and cognitive circuits, sort of uh, complex uh, circuitry in the brain. So this is uh, um, a picture of the original essay written in the 1800s by James Parkinson, who first described Parkinson's disease, which was named after him. Um, and this picture on the right is an actual part of the brain uh, called the midbrain. And um, what you see there is the dark substance. I mean, it sort of stands out there. And uh, when you do a regular stain on the brain, this comes out dark like that. And those cells in that dark area are the brain cells that make dopamine. And then they send that dopamine into different areas of the brain. On the top is someone who does not have Parkinson's disease. And you can see how dark that area is, because it's staining for those cells. On the bottom is a patient who has Parkinson's disease. So you see two things there. One is there's a reduction in the number of those dark cells. And two, it's asymmetric. Um, you see more loss on this side than that side. And that's an important fact about Parkinson's disease, that it's an asymmetric disease. Um, the primary age of onset is uh, around the decades between 40 and 70 is the bulk of the patient population. Um, basically, the average age is about 65. There are approximately a million people in the uh, United States with Parkinson's disease. Um, and it represents about 1% of the population over the age of 65. Um, the prevalence, which is if you took a population, how many people in that population have Parkinson's disease is about 160 per 100,000. Um, so if you take a city of a million people, that's, there are going to be about 1,500 folks in that city with Parkinson's disease. So a question that I always get, um, almost the first question, 
is, well, what causes Parkinson's disease? And the, the truth is the exact cause we don't know yet. We have a lot of understanding about what happens with Parkinson's disease in the brain. What do we see? Um, certain risk factors from epidemiologic studies where we study populations. But we don't know specifically what it is that causes the disease. The current sort of thinking based on all the data that we have is that there's probably some combination of factors, both genetic risk factors and environmental exposure, um, which is probably also uh, coupled with the natural process of aging in the brain, which there is sort of a natural process of aging um, that does cause a reduction in dopamine cells as, as well as certain other cells in the brain. Um, while, while genetics are involved, the other point I always want to make, uh, especially early on in a diagnosis with a patient, is that it's primarily not an inherited condition. Um, and people always worry about that. Um, about 95% of folks with Parkinson's, it's what we call sporadic, meaning that patient developed Parkinson's, but it's not that they inherited it from anybody or that they're going to pass it on to anybody. Um, in about 5% of the population with Parkinson's, we do see an inheritability and that we have certain genes that have been discovered um, that are inheritable. But we see that really with young onset Parkinson's, folks who are diagnosed in their 30s and 40s. And that's when you start to say, well, do you have a lot of family members with Parkinson's and you can do genetic testing. So how do we diagnose Parkinson's disease? You know, people want to know, is this what I have? Is it definitive? Um, and cur currently, the, pr the primary way we diagnose Parkinson's is clinically, meaning a physician basically does a history and physical exam. And based on the history in terms of how the symptoms presented and the exam findings, you make the diagnosis. Um, you do some testing, often to exclude other conditions that can look like Parkinson's disease, but the testing isn't done to diagnose. In other words, an MRI scan, for example, which is a test often uh, people will get, is not going to show Parkinson's disease. Um, certainly, there are some features that might be suggestive. They're very subjective. It's not definitive. It's not the kind of test you would say, hang your hat on. Um, uh, the, the, um, the, the caveat to that is that there is a new test that has recently been approved by the FDA that's not yet commercially available in Richmond but will be um, that actually can very accurately um, tell you whether you have Parkinson's disease or, or not. Like, for example, it can distinguish Parkinson's disease from essential tremor or from medication-induced Parkinson's, people who are on certain medicines that can cause the symptoms of Parkinson's. It can actually show um, this loss of dopamine cells in the brain fairly accurately. Um, and so that's going to be a big part of, right now, mostly in research centers, because in order to enroll in trials, you want to make sure you got the accurate diagnosis. Um, there's still a lot of weight put on the clinical diagnosis, meaning the, the, the physician's exam. This is that scan that uh, will eventually become available. It's called a DAT scan. And, um, what this scan involves is basically um, using an injected chemical, or rate what we call a radio tracer, um, that is, is picked up by those, those dopamine cells. And on the left, you see a certain region in the brain that those cells send their dopamine to. Um, and that's someone who doesn't have Parkinson's disease. On the right is a scan where you can see there's loss of those cells. And so there's a difference between the two. That's someone who does have Parkinson's disease. So this is sort of uh, a relatively new, new thing. So how do we make the diagnosis clinically? What am I looking for in the clinic that will suggest the diagnosis? Um, what have, what's been described and essentially what we have in our textbooks is what we call the cardinal features. These are the primary features. And the cardinal features, someone said something? You can all hear me, OK? The cardinal features uh, essentially are um, the tremor, which is what we call a resting tremor, meaning that it's present when you're at rest, as opposed to a tremor that's really there when you go to do something. Um, but tremor is not a requirement. In fact, a significant percentage of folks with Parkinson's disease don't have tremor at all. Um, so that's not a requirement, but it's one of the, considered one of the cardinal features. What is a requirement to make the diagnosis, which you have to have, is something that we call bradykinesia. And that's a me the term there, brady, Brady means slow, and kinesia means movement. 
So it's a slowness of movement. Um, the, uh, and that's really the, 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 the cornerstone of the diagnosis, is seeing that s the slowness. Um, the other thing that you have to have is what we call rigidity, um, which I often describe as just a stiffness. So that's when you're testing muscle tone, you can feel a stiffness in the muscles. That's rigidity. So those two things are really required. Another feature that we often see is called postural instability, which basically boils down to poor balance um, and sort of a feeling of falling. Um, now, there are lots of other features of Parkinson's disease. Um, one of the things that's actually kind of a core feature is as this asymmetric uh, aspect, what I showed you on that, that picture of the brain, that the dopamine cells, for some reason, are always lost more on one side than the other. In other words, symptoms are always a little bit worse on one side. In some cases, they'll often just start on one side. Um, it will eventually involve the other side, but there's, a, like I said, an asymmetry there. Um, and some people consider that almost a core feature. The other thing that's really important with the diagnosis is that you see an improvement in those symptoms of stiffness and slowness with the, medica the traditional medications. Um, so a response to medication is, is characteristic and, and suggestive of Parkinson's disease. Um, additional features, things that we're thinking about or paying attention to, are what we call a shuffling gait, which is the feet are sort of shuffling and scuffing on the, on the carpet. Um, something that people will describe is that their handwriting gets smaller. So you start writing, and then it sort of gets smaller and smaller as you're writing. Um, uh, there's a, a loss of the emotion or facial expression that pe people can have, sort of what we call a, a masked face, of just sort of a very relaxed uh, face. People notice that their speech gets quieter or softer, which I hear mostly from the spouses, um, that you know, they can't hear them speak up, speak up. Um, and loss of sense of smell actually has become, uh, it's sort of interesting. Loss of sense of smell is one of the earliest symptoms of Parkinson's, sometimes happening decades before you might present clinically with uh, some of the stiffness and slowness. And, uh, and more and more data is suggesting that that always happens, whether people are aware of it or not. The, the, the neurons involved in your smell um, are the first ones to be injured by, by the disease process. But it's very hard. You know, you don't typically hear folks come into the clinic saying, my chief complaint is my food doesn't taste as good as it used to taste. You know, some people just sort of, it happens so gradually, most people don't notice. Other things that we see are disturbance of sleep. So people, people's sleep gets disturbed. They'll wake up during the night. They might m have movements at night that wake them up. Um, they're at increased risk for sleep apnea. Um, and sometimes uh, issues with acting out dreams, um, which some people are familiar with. So then there are a variety of what we call non-motor symptoms. Um, and these are symptoms that have been, uh, that, that can go along with Parkinson's disease. Not everything, not everybody will experience everything, um, but to a varying degree, people will experience these symptoms. Um, these things include depression and anxiety. Um, in fact, sometimes anxiety that responds to medicine in other words, one of the symptoms of wearing off from medication is that you get real anxious and then you get your medicine and it actually calms that down. Um, sometimes people have issues with lightheadedness, especially when they change positions, so stand up and get a little woozy or lightheaded or feel weak or like they can't think um, whenever they change position. Urinary incontinence is, um, we see that because uh, people develop bladder spasms. Um, and so they have difficulty sometimes holding their urine, and there's medications that can treat that. Um, for a lot of these non-motor symptoms, there are treatments, but they're not PD treatments. They're not Parkinson's meds. They're meds that treat symptoms, um, but they can make a big difference. Uh, meds or other interventions make a big difference on people's quality of life. Um, there's issues with sexual dysfunction, constipation, um, something that we're uh, seeing is issues with pain, which goes along with a lot of that stiffness and rigidity, and people will experience pain or discomfort associated with their medications. Um, restless legs, uh, which is an achiness in the legs, mostly at night when you're sitting still, that goes away when you're walking or move, is a common thing that we see with Parkinson's. 
Um, sometimes folks have issues with drooling, where the, they're, they're salivating a little bit too much and drooling. Um, sometimes people have problems with swallowing. Um, a, a small percentage of folks with Parkinson's will have some memory difficulties, you know, really later in, this, in, the, in the course of the disease. And sometimes people will complain of, of double vision or vision problems. So uh, the vast majority of the rest of my slides are going to talk about treatment. And um, the first question is whether to start treatment at diagnosis. And that's sort of a hotly debated topic, is when, when do you start medications? Um, and, and, and I probably could talk for too long about that, but um, uh, a lot of it depends on you know, how severe are the symptoms um, and are they interfering with your uh, quality of life. Um, but one of the, regardless of the decision to start a medication, some of the things that are important to emphasize early on is to encourage physical exercise. And there's more and more data coming out that exercise is very good for the brain. It actually can help preserve brain cells, both those involved in Parkinson's and other brain cells in terms of memory and things like that. So, it really is uh, a very good thing to start to get into uh, some sort of exercise routine. Um, because there's some data that it really slows the progression of the disease down, which is a real huge thing to say. Um, the majority of our medications are really tr aimed at treating the symptoms, not slowing the disease down or stopping the progression. And so to have something that can actually slow the process down that's huge, and so that needs to be heavily emphasized to, to just start doing something. You know, anywhere you start is going to be good. Um, people ask about vitamins and, and su supplements. Um, there, there's lots of different studies that were done, things with like vitamin E, uh, B2, which is riboflavin. Um, there's uh, big studies done with coenzyme Q10, which people will ask me about. Um, the story with coenzyme Q10 is that at high doses, um, sort of uh, over 1,000 milligrams, and the capsules are usually 100 or 200 milligram, but at high doses, it can be somewhat helpful. The, the, the downside to that is it's because it's a vitamin, insurance isn't going to pay for it, and it's actually fairly expensive, and the, the benefits in the studies were sort of marginal. So you'll hear people who do really well with it and love it, um, but it's going to be a big cost out of pocket. Um, so I, I leave that decision up to the patients. I don't want to say, you've got to do this. It's, you know, we have some data that might help a little bit, and then they're spending hundreds of dollars a month. Um, I think diet's important. People always ask, is there anything I can do with my diet? It's not so much that there's any specific thing, to be honest, especially early on. It's just important to eat healthy. It's also important to get a lot of fiber in your diet because the constipation is an issue. Um, so getting a lot of fiber in the diet and trying to prevent that from really ever becoming a problem. Um, uh, there is a, sort of a, a diet related to Parkinson's in a sense that protein in your diet can compete with some of the medications for absorption. And when people are having more issues with wearing off um, between doses of medicine and much more dependent on the exact amount of medicine in their system, sometimes we'll try to implement a, a lower protein diet. But it's a tremendous hassle and impact on your life and, and, and the benefits sometimes are marginal. So it's, you know, it's something that can be done, but it doesn't, uh, it's not of, often worth all the effort that's involved. Um, sleep is really important. People say we have good days and bad days, and a lot of that sometimes is related to sleep. You know, if you get a, a good night's sleep, then the next day or two you, you just do better. The brain needs that sleep um, to, uh, to sort of recover from the day's activities. And um, so when folks are having a lot of good days and bad days, I, I always ask about sleep. Um, are they getting good sleep? And then if we need to figure out how to improve that. Um, and then obviously education about the treatment options is an important part of the early uh, treatment in terms of uh, giving, giving you information to know wh what is this medication doing, what is it for, and what can I expect in terms of side effects. So the questions we ask, are the symptoms bothersome? Um, and that's really subjective. I mean, sometimes it's obvious that symptoms are bothersome, but it really depends. It depends on what stage of life you're in. If you're employed, are the symptoms interfering with job function? Are they interfering with social engagement or getting out and doing things? Or are they just making you unhappy? I mean, uh, and so at, uh, those are questions that are important to ask. 
Um, and then it's also important to say, well, what symptoms are actually bothersome? I mean, is it the stiffness that's bothersome or is it the depression that's bothersome? Um, because, you know, you're going to aim your treatment at, at the symptom that you're dealing with. Um, and then another question is, of all the different choices of medication, um, which one do you start with? And the, the truth is that's a whole different lecture topic in, in terms of being able to go into detail about that. Um, there's no real rule about, you know, everybody should just do this exact plan. It really is dependent on the patient, um, their age, their situation, um, how much benefit they want to get from medicine in terms of how robust the treatment needs to be. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of thinking that goes into that decision. So this, is, this slide is just a busy slide that lists a lot of the medications that exist. I'm going to go in and sort of explain them in, in a little more detail. Um, but just to review, uh, this, these medications all deal with dopamine. And so I talked about dopamine, and dop that lack of dopamine causes the motor symptoms, the stiffness, the slowness, tremor. Um, so a lot of the treatments are aimed at either replacing dopamine or stimulating the same receptors that dopamine stimulates or preventing the breakdown of dopamine. And that's sort of what these different medications do. Um, and just to, I'll just, I'm going to talk about levodopa. I'm going to talk about um, dopamine agonists. Um, and then com, com T inhibitors and MAO, M, MO, actually that's MAO, inhibitors um, in, more, in more detail. So to give you a framework for these medications and, and how, they, how they treat the symptoms, this is a picture of the end of one neuron, the end of one brain cell, the, the, the projection of that brain cell. And, and that's the big, big thing on top there. And this is the next brain cell that it has to communicate with. And so this is that brain cell that makes dopamine. And these bubbles are full of dopamine. And this is what, exactly what it looks like. And essentially, this dopamine is released into this space here and attaches to a receptor. And the dopamine, when it binds to that receptor, sends a signal to that next cell. So the medications work at different aspects of this whole process. Um, Levodopa, which is a precursor to dopamine, is a chemical that actually is in your body naturally. It's what gets converted into dopamine, um, is a common medication that we use. Levodopa essentially gets into that cell, gets converted into dopamine, and then is released as dopamine. There's another class of medications that are called dopamine agonists. And what that means is they actually work at the receptor. So they're not taken up by the first cell. They come in and attached to that receptor and sort of trick it into thinking it's seeing dopamine, even though it's not dopamine. Um, when that dopamine is released into that space, there are other chemicals that then break it down. So it doesn't live there forever. It gets broken down and, and taken away. And so some of the medications block those enzymes so that that dopamine that your brain releases can actually s hang out longer, work longer, and then oftentimes get taken back up um, into the cell and used and almost recycled and used again. So um, the, I bold and underlined levodopa because a lot of folks don't realize what their medicines are because of all the different names and generic names and things like that. Um, but one of the uh, most robust symptomatic medications essentially is levodopa because it gets turned into dopamine. Um, but, but people know it as carbidopa levodopa or cinemet. Um, and, but the, the really, the medicine is the levodopa. The, it's paired with carbidopa to minimize side effects of nausea. Um, for some reason, they put that in front, which makes everyone think that the medicine is carbidopa. Um, but it really is the most robust symptomatic medicine. I mean, when you start levodopa, you're giving people back dopamine. The symptoms of tremor, stiffness, and slowness can improve fairly quickly um, when you replace the dopamine. Um, there, there's an immediate release form, and there's a controlled release form. The idea is the controlled release form is meant to last longer. Um, it was made many years ago, and the reality didn't fit with the hope that it would do that. The reality is it was variably absorbed, and because we like to know exactly how much medicine people are getting so their symptoms are stable, having something that's not always absorbed the same way is not a good thing. And so we rarely use the controlled release cinemet. Um, uh, but you know, only in certain situations. Um, but there are new formulations coming out um, that are aimed at trying to, do, to figure out how to make this levodopa last longer. 
Um, the primary downside, it's a great medicine for symptoms. The downside is it's very short acting. It gets taken up and then it gets broken down. And so it lasts for a very short period of time. So initially people can get away with taking it three times a day. But uh, eventually folks are taking it, you know, every four hours, every three hours, um, you know, and, and, and that becomes an issue. Um, its primary side effects are nausea, um, a lightheadedness. Um, it can make people feel fatigued. Um, but one of the big issues we run into at high doses is something called dyskinesia. And that's another important word that I bolded um, because it's a good thing to understand because doctors are going to ask about that. And what I say, what I describe it as is the wiggles. It's sort of a wiggling kind of movement. And I always show people what it looks like because that's easier than describing it. Um, but, but people say, well, I, I, you know, I tremor, but that's different. Tremor is sort of what you're, which people are mostly familiar with as one of their early symptoms. Dyskinesia is a side effect of medication, this sort of wiggling. So that's something that can be ameliorated if you're, if you're telling your physician about it. And they may not see it because you may not be having it in the, in the clinic. You may have it for a couple of hours a day. You have to report it so that they know that you're having it. If you're having a little dyskinesia, it's not something that you have to worry about. Um, and some people will have a little bit of dyskinesia and it doesn't bother them. So it's not worth, uh, you know, chasing it. But, it. but if it is bothersome, there are things that can be done to minimize it. Um, but because of that issue, we, ha we like sometimes to use other medicines that are less likely to cause dyskinesia. And dopamine agonists do that. Um, Requip and Mirapex are the two big uh, commonly used dopamine agonists. And like I said, they stimulate that receptor and sort of trick the brain into seeing it's getting cinnamon. It, it's a pretty robust treatment. It helps the symptoms uh, really well. Not as you know huge as Cinemet, but pretty close. Um, there's a lot less dyskinesia with the dopamine agonists, and the other thing is they last longer. So there's a lot less of the sort of fluctuations. And um, I'm sort of speeding up here because we're running out of time, but um, um, the side effects you have to worry about are um, any dopamine medicine. You got to worry about nausea. Um, fatigue is a potential side effect. It has a unique side effect though called impulse control disorder, which is sort of impulsive behavior. And so that's sort of like, for men it ends up being gambling and for women it's shopping. And it can be really problematic. <laughs> I, it's the truth, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> But it can be problematic. I mean, people have lost their, you know, gone bankrupt, um, you know, gambling their money away. So uh, it's important to warn people about that. Um, and you need to be careful using these medications in, in uh, older folks because it can cause confusion or hallucinations. Um, and there is a once daily version of both of these, which is convenient in a sense you only take one pill and it lasts 24 hours. Um, so that's a benefit there. This other class is what we call MAO inhibitors. And this is a class of medicines that does blocks the chemical that breaks the dopamine down. So it allows the dopamine that, you're, that you have to sort of last longer and do more. These are nice because they were once, or uh, in the case of Restagiline, just once daily medicine, and it lasts 24 hours, and it can help smooth out the effects of some of the other medications you might be on, or just provide some mild symptomatic benefit really early on in the disease. Um, so these are medicines that we'll either start some, someone who has very mild symptoms early on, or as an add-on therapy later on, and generally well-tolerated, very minimal side effects. Um, there are a couple of other medicines that you'll see used less commonly. One of them is called amantadine, which often we use to actually treat dyskinesia, and it can also help with tremor. Um, I'm going to go fast, but you all have handouts. Another class is anticholinergics, which is too complicated to explain why they work in Parkinson's disease, but sometimes we'll use artane or cogentin for mild symptoms, um, primarily tremor. And th they have a lot of side effects, so we really tend not to use them. They cause dry mouth, confusion, hallucinations fairly consistently. So um, early in the disease process, people generally respond very well to medication. They only need uh, a small amount of medicine. Um, but as the disease, uh, and they only often will need one medicine. But as the disease progresses, you need more and more uh, either doses of medication or uh, the amount of medicine or even adding on medications to try and provide nice symptomatic benefit without, um, without medicines wearing off. And, um, and the goal really is to have symptomatic improvement without side effects. So sometimes lower doses of two or three medicines is better than just a really high dose of one medicine. Um, but as the doses increase, the potential for side effects increases. 
And sometimes people start to experience what we call motor fluctuations, which is another important concept. And that's this sort of wearing off or uh, fluctuations throughout the day. People, a term to get familiar with is on time and off time, which is your medicine kicks in, you're moving great, but then it kicks off and you're stiff and slow and that's sort of like uh, a cycle throughout the day. And, and there are a lot of things that, that a movement disorder neurologist who knows what they're doing with medicines can try to do to, to minimize that and to try and you know, let the medicines do their job and, and do well for you for as long as possible. But eventually that does become a big issue. And so that's when we start to talk about deep brain stimulation. And deep brain stimulation, unfortunately, is also a topic in and of itself, but really quickly, it's a surgical procedure that can be done that does treat the symptoms of tremor, stiffness, and slowness, those motor symptoms. And it treats them very well, just like levodopa does, but it does it 24 hours a day without taking medication. And you don't have to deal with side effects of hallucinations or dyskinesia or that kind of thing. So it's a great thing for someone who's having a lot of difficulty with medicine. It's not necessarily something you want to do if you're doing great with medicine, because if you can just take a medication a couple times a day and have a, a great you know, symptomatic improvement, you don't need a surgical procedure. But once things start to get more complicated, that's when you start to think about it. Uh, the other folks who consider deep brain stimulation are people who have really bad tremor that just doesn't respond to any medicine. And their stiffness and slowness responds and does great, but the tremor just won't go away. And that's someone who's a candidate for this procedure. Um, and that's why I was just explaining all of that. That's what this slide sort of goes over. Um, treats tremor, stiffness, and slowness without dyskinesia. Um, we can often reduce medication significantly. Um, it's nice that you get 24-hour control of symptoms, which is a big deal at night especially. And also when you first wake up, people often have a hard time getting out of bed. Um, and you got to wait for medicines to kick in. This is nice because it's running. It's treating those symptoms. So you wake up and you're treated. Um, it does not treat all the symptoms of Parkinson's. Uh, and issues with balance, issues with memory are not treated by DBS. And so those are still things that have to be treated in other ways. And that uh, brings me to these sort of we call non-pharmacologic treatments. And this is an important thing. I prescribe a lot of these therapies. People, when they're having trouble with their gait or with their balance, you can't chase balance with medication. You need to get therapy to work on balance. That imbalance that people get, it needs to be treated by a physical therapist. Um, you can over-medicate people trying to fix their balance, and they keep coming back and saying, I'm still off balance. You need to be aware of how to treat the symptoms someone's complaining of. Um, the quiet speech that people get can be treated with speech therapy. And there are certain techniques to try to teach people to speak loud and slow. Um, I often use speech therapy, too, when people are starting to complain of swallowing difficulties. And there's therapy that can help that. In addition, it's also important to just recognize it and to think about what kinds of foods to avoid and that kind of thing. Also, occupational therapy can be very helpful, especially people who are employed or also just uh, to come to the house and check things out and just try to make your life easier um, when it comes to preparing food or you know, the bathroom or the kitchen, that kind of thing. You know, get rid of this throw rug that you're tripping on all the time. You know, just practical things. Um, but that can be very helpful. Um, it's also very important to have a good relationship with your doctor. Um, something that's a, a useful thing to do is to pay attention to the things that are bothering you between, you know, one visit and the next and write them down. It's just impossible when you're in the clinic room and, and someone's saying, how's everything going, to just remember everything that you thought about for the last three months or whatever. So it's nice to sort of jot those things down and have folks who come in with lists, you know, he, he, concern number one. That way that when you leave at your visit, you've got all the things that you're worried about addressed. Um, and pay attention to your symptoms, whatever they are. You know, don't disregard them and think that's not Parkinson's, that's something else or whatever. Just mention what symptoms you're dealing with. Let the physician decide whether that's related to the Parkinson's. And in addition, let them decide if there's anything that can be done about, uh, about it, at least give you options. So it's important to take an active role in your treatment, to be engaged, pay attention to your medications and when you take them, pay attention to your symptoms, do therapy, and, and stay active, exercise, just get routines in your life where you're physically active. And I think in addition, I would say mentally active um, and socially active. Those are all important aspects of therapy. Um, that, then people do better. So I think I made it. Did I make it? <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure we don't have time for questions because this is, uh, there's more things. One question. One question. 
Anybody have a, go ahead, sir. Uh, um, I, the, the question to, uh, the question is what's my position on the use of marijuana? Um, to be honest, I don't, I don't have a position on it because I haven't needed to have a position on it. Um, and, um, so I don't, I don't really have a good understanding of how it might, might help folks. Um, so I don't have a strong opinion about it. I, th I mean, that's just the, the, the truth, yeah. It's not something I've spent too much time considering to this point. <laughs> so anyway, thanks to everybody.